To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Disruptors is one of those businessy words people like to throw around in modern entrepreneurship circles, but changing the way we do business is a tale as old as, well, history. Take chartered companies. These companies monopolized the economy and became a useful new weapon for governments like the English and Dutch to disrupt trade and seize power from previously dominant empires like the Spanish and Portuguese. And over time, chartered companies grew in power too, and even began to take on some of the functions of governments like military conquest, diplomacy, and even taxation. Their success created global competition on an unprecedented scale, and caused a major shift in the control of trade and commerce. Hi, I'm Rob Fuller, and this is Study Hall, Modern World History. The Spanish and Portuguese empires dominated the global economy right up until the end of the 1500s. But by the 1600s, they had serious competition from British and Dutch chartered companies. Chartered companies were funded by high-power investors that received special treatment through their partnerships with the government, like the exclusive authority to sell certain regional products in the home market, outlined in, you guessed it, a charter. You might recognize this kind of power as a monopoly, the full and complete control of supply and trade of certain goods kind of monopoly, that is, not the fun family game night kind. One of these companies was the East India Company, or EIC. Although it was far from the first chartered company, it was one of the most influential. Formed in 1600 by a group of London merchants, their plan was to pool their money together to start a company that would ship spices from India and its surrounding countries back to England. A lot was different in the 16th century. No running water or electricity, and definitely no Instagram. And the English actually seasoned their food. Up until the late 1500s, British merchants had been shut out of the spice trade since it was controlled by Spain and Portugal. But after the British Navy defeated the Spanish Armada, British merchants saw an opportunity to make their spicy dreams come true. But they were going to need help from the Queen herself. That's because only the British monarch could create companies by giving them a charter or a legal document to let them operate. So in 1600, Queen Elizabeth I granted the East India Company a charter that gave them a monopoly on the spice trade from the Cape of Good Hope to the Straits of Magellan. In other words, the East India Company now controlled all of the buying, selling, and trading of spices, like cinnamon and ginger, between England and Asian countries. This partnership was going to be good for the English government, too. It took a lot of cash to get international trade routes started, so it was helpful to have private investors footing the bill. And since ocean voyages were dangerous, those routes came with a lot of financial risk. Now, the East India Company would be responsible for funding the trade route and for paying taxes on imported goods to the British government. The government also saw this as a low-risk way to expand England's political and cultural influence. In order to keep up with the competition, the Dutch government created their own chartered company in 1602 called the United East India Company, or the VOC, with plans to dominate the same Asian trade markets that the East India Company was after. Both governments were counting on reaping the benefits of the discoveries, expansions, and profits earned by chartered companies, and taxing their profits along the way. This was all based on a new economic theory called mercantilism. Mercantilism was an economic practice where governments would sponsor trading centers and monopolies to stimulate production and squash competition. If nations produced more goods for trade exports and left less room for competition, they'd have more wealth, a stronger economy, and a more powerful position on the world stage. Another way to think about it is the larger my piece of the commercial pie, the less there is left over for you. Pie. Although European nations had used regulation of market access as a means of tightening trade and boosting profits before, the scale of this was unprecedented. And England and the Netherlands made their pie look so good that it didn't take long for other European states to start their own chartered companies. In 1664, King Louis XIV of France granted a royal charter to the French East India Company and became its biggest investor to compete with the British and Dutch for control of the spice trade in the East Indies. So you get an East India Company, you get an East India Company, East India Companies for everyone! But it wasn't just smooth sailing from there. These chartered monopoly agreements only applied to their home country. 
So while the French, Dutch, and British East India companies didn't have to worry about other competition from domestic merchants, they still had to fight one another for control of East Indian trade. So let's take a little step back before things get too convoluted. The British East India Company wanted the upper hand when it came to cloth and other textiles. Indian fabrics were very on trend in Europe, and monopolizing textile trade could make them a pretty penny. Before long, the East India Company built trading posts along the coast of India beginning in 1612 in the city of Surat. They quickly followed up with more ports along the coast of India and established posts in the Bay of Bengal, Mumbai, and Calcutta, which became their headquarters in 1690. The takeover of oceanic trade in India gave the English better access to trade in China as well, so this made it easier to fulfill England's high demand for Chinese teas. But the East India Company wasn't the only one making moves in the Indian Ocean. The Dutch wanted to control the trade of spices from the aptly named Spice Islands there in Indonesia, and in 1619 the United East India Company, or VOC, captured Jakarta and established their company's headquarters in the region. As their presence in the East Indies expanded, the Dutch also began to cultivate crops purely for their commercial value. These cash crops included coffee, tea, sugar, and later, opium. I'll just have a coffee, please. This worked out pretty well for the Netherlands, and at its peak, the United East India Company was worth 78 million Dutch guilders. That's the equivalent of about 7.8 trillion US dollars. To put that in perspective, the VOC was richer than Apple, Google, and Meta combined. But these companies couldn't have accomplished all this without proper governance and control. The East India Company diversified its decision-making process by having two levels of oversight. A superior body in London, called the Court of Directors, and a subordinate body of presidents who were distributed throughout each of the company's separate trading regions. Similarly, the Dutch United East India Trading Company had a board of 17 directors, with a main office in Amsterdam, and a governor general and council who ran operations in Asia and reported back to the board of directors at home. You might notice that so far this all sounds pretty much identical to good old-fashioned imperialism. The only difference is that now, as chartered companies rose to power in the 18th century, the authority to, you know, use military force to take over land for political and financial gain, impose European cultures on indigenous traditions, and transform the local economy for your own benefit, now fell to private companies rather than the government itself. The English government even supported the East India Company's bids for political power, like when Parliament installed East India Company merchants as governors in India, which they considered the private property of the company itself. These merchants were given authority to collect taxes and build local armies. This gave governmental control to the company, not the crown, and the East India Company ruled their territory with extreme violence, while British officials often looked the other way. The United East India Company had similar leverage in Dutch politics. They were the biggest engine for economic growth in the Netherlands, so over time the government allowed them to act as an independent state within the Dutch Empire. Their royal charter gave them the right to build fortresses, wage war, make treaties with Asian rulers, punish and execute criminals, create new colonies, and even mint their own coins. So instead of imposing regulations, governments like the British and the Dutch doubled down and invested even more money and power into their chartered companies. But with their immense wealth and political influence, chartered companies became harder and harder to keep in check. Because at the end of the day, chartered companies were really only interested in one thing, becoming wealthy superpowers in their own right. This meant that the people running these companies often made decisions that increased their wealth and power in the short term, but came back to bite them later on and wrecked total havoc on indigenous peoples in the process. For example, the people living in the Bengal region in India were hit with a one-two punch of extreme drought and a smallpox epidemic in the late 1760s to early 1770s. But instead of granting struggling Bengalis leeway on their taxes, which the East India Company had just raised by a whopping 30%, they had local tax officials collect money at gunpoint. That left locals without the money or resources they needed to survive, and as a result, 10 million Bengalis died of starvation. After that tragedy, the British Parliament finally cracked down on the East India Company. 
they could no longer ignore that the East India Company was more than just an economic organization, but a political one, which meant it had to abide by many of the same rules as the English government. So the government issued the 1773 Regulating Act, which established a regulatory board that reported directly to Parliament. The British government's regulation of the East India Company continued to increase over the next 60 years, until 1857 when Bengali soldiers launched a successful mutiny against the company's control. By that point, the EIC's downfall was fully underway. Meanwhile, the United East India Company also began its decline at the end of the 18th century. Their trade practices struggled to keep pace with changes in demand, and the company failed to shift their exports from traditional spices to newer commodities, like opium, that would bring better profits for them. Kind of like how Blockbuster doubled down on movie rentals when Netflix was right there. This was made worse by the United East India Company's dividend policy, which made big payouts to investors that the company funded by taking out loans. These debts were then compounded by the money burned governing and maintaining troops and fighting wars. All of these debts, combined with corruption and mismanagement, reduced the amount of money that the company could invest back into trade, and as a result, the Dutch government nationalized the United East India Company and officially brought it under government control. And by 1800, the Dutch government disbanded the United East India Company. By 1874, the British followed suit with their own East India Company. State governments took over the debts of these companies and assumed control of trade and colonization in the territories the East India Company and United East India Company had previously ruled. No matter how you slice it, these chartered companies disrupted the way global business was done in the 17th century. They promised governments that they'd make tons of money for their empires and expand their political reach without having to take on the expense of spinning up new trade routes. Chartered companies like the East India Company and the United East India Company made good on their promises at first. They quickly expanded and became two of the biggest corporations the world had ever seen, and cash started trickling and then rushing into the wallets of investors and governments alike. Their willingness to take on risk was great for governments in the beginning, but over time led both companies to make terrible decisions that led to widespread and often overlooked violence and suffering in India, Indonesia, and other colonized territories in the Indian Ocean region. And while the East India Company and United East India Company aren't around today, they expanded international trade routes and created a blueprint for the massive corporate growth we still see today. If you're enjoying Study Hall Modern World History and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click on this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.